the latter rain. The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles was the former rain and glorious was the result, but the latter rain will be more abundant, powerful. Friends, don't miss out on this. Peter and Paul would give their right arm. We're going to have a larger portion of a Holy Spirit than they had in the apostolic church. Powerful. Testimonies for the church, volume 8, page 21. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. The commencement of that time here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plagues will begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while Christ is in the sanctuary, while the work of salvation is closing, probation is still open for the saints, Trouble will be coming on the earth and the nations will be very angry, will be angry, yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, the latter rain of refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. Early writings, page 85. When Jesus leaves the most holy place, we receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I was shown that if God's people make no efforts on their part, but wait for the refreshing to come upon them and remove their wrongs and correct their errors, if they depend upon that to cleanse them from filthiness of the flesh and spirit and fit them to engage in the loud cry of the third angel, they will be found wanting. The refreshing or power of God comes only to those who have prepared themselves for it by doing the work which God bids them, namely, cleansing themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 619. Totally different from what we've heard in church. Oh no, you can't be perfect now. Jesus has to do it for you. Of course Jesus has to do it, but we have to do our part. Jesus tells us, stop smoking. And we got to say, okay, Lord, I am not going to smoke anymore. I'm going to take my box of cigarettes, throw it down, and then say, Lord, take this temptation away from me. I'm going to pray for this every day, Lord. Take this temptation for me, from me. This is how Jesus does it for us. But we've got to put our foot down. Appetite is a problem. We've got to put our foot down. Lust is a problem. We've got to put our foot down. It's dying to self daily. That's what, he talks, that's what he's talking about. Many have in a great measure failed to receive the former rain. They expect that the lack will be supplied by the latter rain. They are making a terrible mistake. It was by the confession and forsaking of sin, by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves to God that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The same work only in greater degree must be done now. Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. If God is telling me to stop stealing, why is he going to tell me to stop committing adultery if I don't stop stealing? Only those who are living to the light they have will receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. We won't even recognize it. We won't realize that it's happening. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. And when we see people in church godly like Jesus, we're going to say, oh, he's a fanatic. Friends, it may be falling on hearts all around us and we will not discern or receive it. If we do not progress, if we do not place ourselves in an attitude to receive both the former and the latter rain, we shall lose our souls. The convocations of the church as in camp meetings, the assemblies of the home church and all occasions where there is personal labor for souls, are God's appointed opportunities for giving the early and the latter rain. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers 507 and 508, important quote. The words holy convocation or holy convocations 
are only mentioned 18 times in the Bible. In each instance, it refers to one of God's festivals, a holy convocation. When people say, oh, this last Sabbath was a holy convocation, it was a high day. You cannot have a high day on a Sabbath unless a feast day, a holy convocation or the feast falls on that, high, on that Sabbath. That's a high day. A holy convocation is a holy convocation. It's only a feast. The prophecies of the 18th of Revelation will soon be fulfilled. During the proclamation of the third angel's message, another angel is to come down from heaven having great power, and the earth is to be lighted with his glory. During the loud cry, still in the future, the church, aided by the providential interpositions of her exalted Lord, will diffuse the knowledge of salvation so abundantly that light will be communicated to every city and town. The light of present truth will be seen flashing everywhere. The word declares, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away this thorny, this thorny heart out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Those brackets are mine. That's an exact quote out of Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. You know, many times Ellen White did not put the quotation in, in the Review and Herald. She never did. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. This is the descent of the Holy Spirit sent from God to do its office work. When we receive the Holy Spirit, God will show us the statutes. If we reject God's statutes, we are rejecting God. If we accept His statutes, we continue to move forward. Friends, read these quotes, pray about them. God is not playing games with us. God forgave the children of Israel 10 times. And then he said, you know what? I've had it. I can't. You're not going to change. And the Gentiles had their opportunity. Romans 9 and 11, both chapters talk about now when the Gentiles are finished, the Jews are going to come in and the nation is going to be born in a day, she says. The house of Israel is to be imbued with the Holy Spirit and baptized with the grace of salvation. Amid the confusing cry, Lo, here is Christ, Lo, there is Christ, will be born a special testimony, a special message of truth appropriate for this time, which message is to be received, believed, and acted upon. When you accept God's feast, you have to act on them. You know, most people have two weeks of vacation in the world including the United States. When you're a feast keeper, you don't get to go to Colorado unless you're rich because you go to keep God's feast and you go willingly and lovingly because there you can learn about, about survival. You can learn about the health message. You can learn about the prophecies. Why? Because you have seven days in the spring, seven days in the fall, where you can have somebody come and speak for 10 or 12 hours in a, in, a, in a seminar. When are you going to do that on church from Sabbath to Sabbath? You'll forget what you did the week before. It just makes sense. It makes sense. That's why people were holy before. That's why we're not. It is the truth, not fanciful ideas, that is efficacious. As men, women, and children proclaim the gospel, the Lord will open the eyes of the blind to see his statues. How can, you, how can you take that any other way? And will write upon the hearts of the truly penitent his law, the animating spirit of God working through human agencies, leads the believers to be of one mind, one soul, united in loving God and keeping his commandments preparing here below for translation. 
Other chapters will open before us, like Leviticus 16, which has opened after 30 years. And in order to discern their meaning, we shall need keen perception. In the future, Satan de Satan's deceptions will assume new forms. False theories clothed with garments of light will be presented to God's people. What are the false theories? We're hung up on the Trinity. We're hung up on the name of God. We're hung up on being self-righteous. We're hung up on a whole bunch of different things, but we're not hung up on sin. We're still dealing with sin. Friends, I'm sorry, but I may not have another opportunity of talking and, and sharing this message. I have to tell you what I have in my heart. This is the message that God has given me, not you, but me, for me, not for you, for me. And I'm applying it to me. Thus, Satan will try to deceive, if possible, the very elect. Our watchword is to be to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Review and herald the closing work. The eyes of the blind will be opened to see his statues. This is the closing work. This is what she titled it. One final thought. To the law and to the testimony. Check that out. I've got that in my 6,000 year series. The law is the five books of the Bible, talking about all the statutes, etc. The testimony are the two tables of stone written with the finger of God that were to be a convincing testimony to the world in this time that we're coming. We're going to study it right now in a little while. So to the law and to the testimony, if they're not abiding by the law, if they're not keeping the law, if they're eating pork, if they're not paying tithe, if they're still eating gr uh, grease and blood and fat, if they're eating unclean animals, there's no light in them. If they're not keeping the statutes, there's no light in them. We cannot do the same thing that the Protestants do. Oh, uh, we, we keep nine commandments, but when it comes to the Sabbath, no, that's, that's not applicable to us. No, this is what they've accused us of for 150 years now. <clears throat> Seventh-day Adventists are behaving the same thing with the same way with feast keepers. Cannot be. <clears throat> God is not respecter of persons, friends. The tables of stone will be a convincing testimony. Before the temple was destroyed, God made known to a few of his faithful servants the fate of the temple. These righteous men, just before the destruction of the temple, removed the sacred ark containing the tables of stone, and with mourning and sadness secreted it in a cave where it was to be hid from the people of Israel because of their sins and was to be no more restored to them. That sacred ark is yet hid. It has never been disturbed since it was secreted. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, pages 114 and 115. In the middle of this whole convulsion that's coming, when Jesus steps out of the most holy place, persecution starts. Satan appears and says, Sunday is the day to keep. All of a sudden, the tables of stone written with the finger of God are going to be presented to the world and people are going to say, wow, wow, how do we make this decision now? When the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened. This is, this is not the judgment of 1844. This is the judgment of the living because this is written after 1844. It's written in 1909. And every man shall be judged according to the things written in the books. Then the tables of stone hidden by God until that day will be presented before the world as the standard of righteousness. Then men and women will see that the prerequisite of their salvation is, not was, obedience to the perfect law of God. Review on Herald, January 28, 1909. The precious record of the law was placed in the Ark of the Testament and is still there, safely hidden from the human family. But in God's appointed time, that's a moed in the Bible, not in the spirit of prophecy, but it's still appointed time. That's what it's called in the Bible. All the appointed times are moeds, they're feast days. We don't know when this is going to happen. But in God's appointed time, he will bring forth these tables of stone to be a testimony to all the world against the disregard of his commandments and against the idolatrous worship of a counterfeit Sabbath. 
Manuscript Releases, Volume 8, page 100. These tables of stone will be brought forth from their hiding place, and on them will be seen the Ten Commandments engraved by the finger of God. These tables of stone now lying in the Ark of the Testament will be a convincing testimony. That's why they're called the tables of testimony. Put the testimony inside the Ark. To the truth and binding claims of God's law. Maranatha, page 286. The sealing. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not a seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has begun already. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1161. The seal is a settling into the truth. Now, don't try to tell me anymore that the Holy Spirit does not exist. I am settled in that. I'm convinced of that. I don't have to study that. Don't try to tell me that Sunday may be the day of rest. No, I'm convinced Sabbath is the day of rest. I'm convinced of the state of the dead. We have settled into the truth. We have to settle into the truth about not sinning and being perfect for God while we are alive now. We have to get to that point. Only he who has true faith in secure, is secure against presumption. For presumption is Satan's counterfeit of faith. Faith claims God's promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. Presumption also claims the promises, but uses them as Satan did to excuse transgression. Faith would have led our first parents to trust the love of God and to obey his commandments. Presumption led them to transgress his law, believing that his great love would save them from the consequence of their sin. Desire of Ages, page 126. An angel with a writer's inkhorn by his side returned from the earth and reported to Jesus in the holy place that his work was done and the saints were numbered and sealed. Then I saw Jesus, who had been ministering before the ark containing the Ten Commandments, throw, the censer, throw down the censer. He raised his hands and with a loud voice said, It is done. Early Writings 2.79 Jesus is the angel in front of the golden altar in Revelation 8.3 and in the altar that is before the Lord in Le Leviticus 16.18. There is no altar in the most holy place. I'm going over these things because I know the time that I had with this. This is why Mrs. White says Jesus who had been ministering before the ark, he had already left the most holy place. An angel returning from the earth announces that his work is done. The final test has been brought upon the world and all who have proved themselves loyal to the divine precepts have received the seal of the living God. Then Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary, had already left the most holy place. He lifts his hands and with a loud voice says, it is done. Probation closes, we have to be sealed. We cannot remember our sins anymore if not we're going to be lost. I had a vision of events all in the future, and I saw the time of trouble such as never was. Jesus told me it was the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble commences when he throws down the censer, and that we should be delivered out of it by the voice of God. Just before we entered it, we all received the seal of the living God. So the seal of the living God those people that receive it, the 11th hour workers and the saints that are alive while Jesus is in the most holy place, they have to go through all of that testing until finally probation closes. By that time, they're sealed. And if you lived in the past, the sealing began in the past because when you die, you're sealed. One way or the other, you're sealed. The true people of God will always be on the side of faithful and plain dealing with sins which easily beset the people of God, especially in the closing work for the church, in the sealing time of the 144,000, will they feel most deeply the wrongs of God's professed people. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 266. 
In every phase of your character building, you are to please God. This you may do, for Enoch pleased him through though living in a degenerate age. And there are Enochs in this our day. Christ Object Lessons, page 332. You've seen some of these people. You've heard about them. Uh, people that have done nothing but good all their lives, that are holy people, that you, you get around them or you read about what they were to the people that were around them and they were, they were just an inspiration. They were just filled with the Holy Spirit. There are Enoch's in our day today. There are people that are holding on to God for all they got. They, they do not want to sin against God. We have to get there. Those that overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil will be the favored ones who receive, receive the seal of the living God. Testimonies to ministers and gospel workers, page 445. You know, <clears throat> it's a very thin line. We don't get to heaven by works. But... If we don't have works that follow our belief and the free gift of eternal life, we're not going to get to heaven either. If I get to heaven and I'm used to partying and smoking and drinking and revelry, I'm not going to be happy in heaven. That's not going to be going on up there. God knows that. He's not going to put me through that. This is what we have to remember. God is helping us. Look, do you want to get rid of your sin? I can help you. I will help you get rid of your sin. You've got to give it up. And then I'm going to give you eternal life. When you get up there, I has not seen nor ear heard the things that, I have, that God has reserved for those that love them. Telescopic vision, microscopic vision, travel to other planets, talk to people that have been around for millions of years. Perfect happiness, no sickness, no death, no sleep. Friends, is that not worth it? When we get to heaven, Ellen White had a vision where she said, when we got there, even though we suffered like crazy, we all said, heaven was cheap enough. When we see what he's reserving for us, the mansions, we're concerned here, oh, why can't I have a good house like the Joneses? When we get to heaven, we're going to have a mansion made of gold. And we're here playing with sin. Friends, God loves us. We've got to obey him. He who has not sufficient faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from sinning has not the faith that will give him an entrance into the kingdom of God. Review on Herald, March 10th, 1904. To everyone who surrenders fully to God is given the privilege of living without sin in obedience to the law of heaven. Little children, let no man deceive you. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. God requires of us perfect obedience. She quotes 1 John. John didn't believe that we should be sinning. Peter didn't believe it. Paul didn't believe it. Review and Herald, September 27, 1906. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. This command is a promise. Satan is jubilant when he hears the professed followers of Christ making excuses for the deformity of character. It is these excuses that lead to sin. There is no excuse for sinning. Not when we have Jesus to help us. A holy temper, a Christ-like life, is accessible to every repenting, believing child of God. The desire of ages 3.11. The means is provided and no one will have any excuse for sin. If you fail of overcoming, there are reasons for this. You will not obey God's revealed will. You will not pray. You will not strive. You will not fight evil habits and unholy thoughts. Arise and make a stand against Satan. Be doing something and do it now. Repent now. Confess for sake. A day of fire and storm is about to burst on our world. Seek the aid of God's spirit by prayer, by watching thereunto, and you will come off more than conquerors through him who hath loved us. Read John 1 John 4.10. Testimonies to ministers 4.55 and 4.56. The tempter can never compel us to do evil. He cannot control minds unless they are yielded to his control. The will must consent. Faith must let go its hold upon Christ before Satan can exercise his power upon us. 
But before, but every sinful desire we cherish affords him a foothold. Every point in which we fail of meeting the divine standard is an open door by which he can enter to tempt and destroy us. And every failure or defeat on our part gives occasion for him to reproach Christ. The Desire of Ages, page 125. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of the ambitious world-loving man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of men or women of false tongues or deceitful hearts. All who receive the seal without the seal must be without spot before God, candidates for heaven. Search the scriptures for yourself that you may understand the fearful solemnity of the present hour. Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 216. Go to the Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, pages 27, 207 to 216, and read the seal of God. You, you need to do that. You, it's nine pages. It'll, it'll, it'll lift you up. It'll show you what's going on in the church right now. Some of our brightest leaders will become ring leaders in apostasy. Because if they're not obeying God right now, their yes. eyes will close and they will call sin righteousness and righteousness sin. Christ had said, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Are you overcoming or are you being overcome by your own lust and appetites and passions? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 511. Every day that you remain in sin, you are in Satan's ranks. And should you sicken and die without repentance, you would be lost. Review and Herald, December 24, 1889. <clears throat> there was a dear sister in the church. She died many years ago, Margaret Davis. Some of you have read her writings if you're over 60 years old. She was a saint, <clears throat> another Ellen White in my opinion. And she did a lot for us. We read all her books. She's got a story on this one quote where she says, I don't remember if it was she heard a sermon or I think she heard a sermon from a pastor that said, you have a man that's going up a ladder and he falls. But he gets up and he keeps on going and he falls. And he gets up and he keeps on going and he falls. But after a while, it's Hebrews 6.6. 6. There's no repentance for those that sin and repent, sin and repent, sin and repent. They're not making any victories. And in one of those trips, he goes into a hotel, is with another woman that is not his wife, and he dies. And the argument is made by this pastor, God knew that had he, had, had he had time to repent, he would have repented and kept on going up. No. Every day that you remain in sin, you are in Satan's ranks. And should you sicken and die without repentance, you would be lost. That's why. Every night before we go to bed, every time we sin during the day, every time we fall, Fall on your knees and say, Lord, I am sorry. Please, Lord, give me this victory. What do I need to do to gain this victory, Lord? Help me, Holy Spirit. Show me what I need to do. Whereas the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Hebrews 3, 7 and 8. Friends, the door may close for you today, for me today. I could go out tomorrow morning and get run over by a car. And if I do, and I've got sin in my heart, all the glory that I was hoping to get is gone. Never made it. Never made it. We cannot be one moment without sin, with sin. The blotting out of sins. In the typical system, which was a shadow of the sacrifice and priesthood of Christ, the cleansing of the sanctuary was the last service performed by the high priest in the yearly round of ministration. It was the closing work of the atonement, a removal or putting away of sin from Israel. It prefigured the closing work in the ministration of our high priest in heaven, in the removal or blotting out of, this, of the sins of his people, which are registered in the heavenly record. This service involves a work of investigation, a work of judgment, 
and it immediately precedes the coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven. Great controversy, page 352. When are they blotted out? It happens way at the end when Jesus finishes his intercession in heaven. On the day of atonement, the high priest, having taken an offering for the congregation, went into the most holy place with the blood and sprinkled it upon the mercy seat above the tables of the law. Thus the claims of the law which he demanded the life of the sinner were satisfied. Then in the character of mediator, the priest took the sins upon himself, and leaving the sanctuary, he bore with him the burden of Israel's guilt. At the door of the tabernacle, he laid his hands upon the head of the scapegoat, and as the goat bearing these sins were sent, was sent away, they were with him regarded as forever separated from the people. Such was his service performed unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. Patriots and Prophets 356. Those who have delayed a preparation for the day of God cannot obtain it in the time of trouble or at any future period. The righteous will not cease their earnest agonizing cries for deliverance. They cannot bring to mind any particular sins, but in their whole life they can see but little good. Their sins had been borne away into the land of forgetfulness, and they could not bring them to remembrance. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 123. The close of probation. Then I saw that Jesus would not leave the most holy place until every case was decided, either for salvation or destruction, and that the wrath of God could not come until Jesus had finished his work in the most holy place, laid off his priestly attire, and clothed himself with the garments of vengeance in the holy place. Early Writings 36. Solemn are the scenes connected with the closing work of the atonement. Momentous are the interests involved therein. The judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. For many years, this work has been, going, has been in progress. Soon, none know how soon it will pass to the cases of the living. In the awful presence of God, our lives are to come up in review. At this time, above all others, it behooves every soul to heed the Savior's admonition. Watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. When the work of the investiga investigative judgment closes, the destiny of all will have been decided for life or death. Probation is ended a short time before the appearing of the Lord in the clouds of heaven. Christ in the revelation, looking forward to that time, declares, He that, he, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Men will be planting and building, eating and drinking, all unconscious that the final irrevocable decision has been pronounced in the sanctuary above. Before the flood after Noah entered the ark, God shut him in and shut the ungodly out. But for seven days the people, knowing not that their doom was fixed, continued their careless, pleasure-loving life and mocked the warnings of impending judgment. So, says the Savior, shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 39. Silently, unnoticed as the midnight thief, look at my note there, referring to men will be planting and building. This has to take place when Jesus leaves the most holy place, not the holy place. Do you think people will be planting and building after the censer is thrown down and Jesus says it is done? After the loud cry? After Satan appears? after persecution and martyrs, after the judgments of God are in the earth, they're not going to be planting and building. They're going to be scared to death. This has to take place now. When Jesus leaves the most holy place, this time comes suddenly upon all. Wicked, 144,000 11th hour workers. Silently, unnoticed as the midnight thief, will come the decisive hour which marks the fixing of every man's destiny, the final withdrawal of mercies offered to guilty man. Watch therefore, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Perilous is the condition of those growing weary of their watch turned to the attractions of the world. While the man of business is absorbed in the pursuit of gain, while the pleasure lover is seeking indulgence, while the daughter of fashion is ar arranging her adornments, it may be in that hour the judge of all the earth will pronounce the sentence, thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Great Controversy 490-491. When Jesus 
plead, ceases to plead for man, the cases of all are forever decided. To those who have neglected the preparation of purity and holiness, which fits them to be waiting ones to welcome their Lord, the sun sets in gloom and darkness and rises not again. Probation closes. Christ's intercessions, two, pr plural, Christ intercessions, most holy and holy, cease in heaven. This time finally comes suddenly upon all. They became weary of waiting and watching. They became indifferent in regard to the coming of their master. They longed not for his appearing. They would be sure not to lose the opportunity of securing an earthly treasure. But while their interest was buried up in their worldly gains, the work closed in the heavenly sanctuary and they were unprepared. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, 191. What is the difference between probation? We came to this question before. We're going to look at it now. What is the difference? Most holy place, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received this mark. Revelation 24. At that time shall Michael stand up. Daniel 12, 1. Probation closes. The censor is thrown down. If the blood of Christ's faithful witness were shed at this time, it would not, like the blood of the martyrs, be a seed sown to yield a harvest for God. Their fidelity would not be a testimony to convince others of the truth. Great Controversy 613 and 634. Probation closes in the holy place and in the most holy. In the most holy, every case is decided. Jesus knows who's going to make it and who doesn't. In the holy, no more martyrs, and the whole universe knows, okay, now, now we know who were the ones that were willing to die and who did not. That's, maybe there's more? I don't know. That's what I can see. Jacob's time of trouble. Jacob's experience during that night of wrestling and anguish represents the trial through which the people of God must pass just before Christ's second coming. The prophet Jeremiah in holy vision looking down to this time said, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. All faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the, ja the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah 35 to 7. When Christ shall cease his work as mediator in man's behalf, then this time of trouble will begin. Satan had accused Jacob before the angels of God, claiming the right to destroy him because of, because of his sin. Satan endeavored to force upon him a sense of his guilt in order to discourage him and break his hold upon God. When, in his distress, Jacob laid hold of the angel, which is Jesus Christ, and made supplication with tears, the heavenly messenger, in order to try his faith, also reminded him of his sin and endeavored to escape from him. But Jacob pointed back to his repentance for his sin and pleaded for deliverance. Such will be the experience of God's people in their final struggle with the powers of evil. God will test their faith, their perseverance, their confidence in his power to deliver them. Satan will endeavor to terrify them with the thought that their cases are hopeless, that their sins have been too great to receive pardon. Their faith will not fail because their prayers are not immediately answered. So in the time of trouble, if the people of God had unconfessed sins to appear before them while tortured with fear and anguish, they would be overwhelmed. But while they have a deep sense of their unworthiness, they will have no concealed wrongs to reveal. Their sins will have been blotted out by the atoning blood of Christ, and they cannot bring them to remembrance. Satan leads many to believe that God will overlook their unfaithfulness in the minor affairs of life. But the Lord shows in his dealing with Jacob that he can in no wise sanction or tolerate evil. All who endeavor to excuse or conceal their sins and permit them to remain upon the books of heaven, unconfessed and unforgiven, 
will be overcome by Satan. Patriots and Prophets 201 and 202. So friends, even when Jacob went to reach to the angel, Jesus, in order to try his faith, pressed him. But Jacob could go back and say, Lord, I've repented of this sin. And then Jacob, uh, Jesus accepted him. This is what we're getting ready to, to go through. If we have one cherished sin, it becomes the unpardonable sin. A decree went forth to slay the saints, which caused them to cry day and night for deliverance. This was the time of Jacob's trouble. The 144,000 triumphed. Their faces with light, were lighted up with the glory of God. Then I was shown a company who were howling in agony. On their garments was written in large characters, Thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. I asked who this company were. The angel said, These are they who have once kept the Sabbath and have given it up. Early writings, page 36. Friends, we cannot go there. We have got to realize that God is trying to give us this last opportunity to get our hearts right with Him. Don't throw away your life. Don't, don't sell your birthright for a mess of pottage like Esau. We can't. We can't. We've come too far to give up now. But yes, it's a sin problem. This is why Jesus died on the cross for us. He had to die. He gave up His omnipresence. So we could have eternal life. Do you think he's going to let us get to heaven sinning? There's not a chance in the world. The seven trumpets. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire off the altar and cast it into the earth. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there, were followed, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. Revelation 8, 2 to 8. Has this ever happened? No. Then the trumpets must be in the future. Can this be literally fulfilled? Yes. The censor is cast into the earth in verse 5. Then probation closes. Trumpet number one sounds in verse 7. It's not a complicated answer. What comes first? The language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning unless a symbol or figure is employed. Great Controversy 598. If that scene that we've just witnessed can be literally fulfilled, then we need to realize the trumpets are in the future. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. At the very time specified, Turkey accepted the protection of the Allied powers of Europe. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement, the Great Controversy 334 and 335. This was in 1840 that Josiah Litch had this interpretation. Solemn events before us are yet to transpire. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded, vial after vial poured out one after another upon the inhabitants of the earth. Scenes of stupendous interest are right upon us. Letter 112, 1890, 50 years after Josiah Litch. When did the 42 months of Revelation 13, 5 commence? 